All right, things just got wild in Hunter x Hunter. This admittedly was a very text heavy installment. Lots of introductions to new characters, abilities, and all sorts of complex political dynamics. All of which adds up to a very game changing chapter. And let's get into it. Wrapping up the adventures of Henry and Wang, we are introduced to a new Nen ability possessed by the old man whose name I still don't think we know yet. What we do know is that at the very least, he is a level 21, meaning that this helpless old man has killed at least 21 people. Allegedly helpless, allegedly according to him. He's a con man, he's not to be trusted. But he appears to be capable of creating a Nen clone. Unfortunately, my Japanese onomatopoeia game is, and it's pretty pathetic. So I can't tell exactly what the substance is here that the clone was created out of. It could be fire, it could be smoke, it could be vapor, it could be any of the other things I haven't said. But given that the clone does become a substance, there's the potential of this ability involving transmutation or conjuration. Like transmuting your aura into a substance and then conjuring a body out of it. But what holds me back from that idea is that there's likely manipulation involved as well, which I just think is one too many disciplines for an amateur, you know, all of the mixing and matching. But then again, maybe not. Contagion might have just done all of the aura mats for him. Like the old man thinks to himself, hmm, I want an ability that does that does this. And then Contagion just says, yeah, yeah, sure thing, buddy, don't worry, I've got you covered. What I do find very fascinating is that the random char R guy, who we know is a char R member because he's the same dude that Wang ordered to bring the money previously, but he states that Nameless Old Man might have a similar ability to the boss. And at first I thought, ooh, is this some intrigue on Wang? Does Wang have some sort of cloning style ability? But in reality, he could be referring to one of three people. Either underboss Wang, vice boss to Zhao, or even the big boss, Broccoli himself. In case you don't remember, yes, that is his actual name, Broccoli. But either way, it was a really stupid thing to say out loud. One, because Henry is there, and yes, they've got a bit of an alliance happening right now, but he's still from a rival gang. And two, because he is giving this information away in Haoli territory. Someone could have an ability that's watching and listening to them in this room right now. In which case the char art guy man has just given away extremely valuable information. However, I am increasingly enjoying Henry's presence in this series. In the past three chapters, he's been nothing short of captivating. I love his analytical prowess. I love the basic but versatile Nen ability. And also I think his design just kind of hits. There's a lot of characters in this arc that let's be honest, just sort of look like random dudes. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. Haley family. So I guess it's just nice to have a character who always stands out amongst the glob of Togashi characters. Oh, and also it was tragically funny watching short soldier guy into the room. It's just like, mate, have, have you paid attention to nothing that just happened here in front of you? The answer to that is no. And Henry, to his credit, did make a mild effort to stop him. You know, he did it like, oh, wait, no, don't don't enter the room. But as soon as he did, everyone was all like, yeah, well, th th he's dead. Sh shall we go for lunch? So that's two people that this trap has now managed to kill, which is bad, very bad, because there were at least two Haley members on level 20, so they just needed one more kill each to develop a Nen ability. And one of them did, I believe his name is Billy, with like an E on the end. He turned out to be a conjurer. And there's some interesting commentary from another member of just just how weird it is that there seems to be a lot of left-handed conjurers, which might be an interesting little sub fact. I know that Shizuku is left-handed, for example, because she used her right hand to arm wrestle Gon, which was her weak hand, and she, she happens to be a conjurer. But then again, Kropika is a conjurer and he appears to be right-handed because that's where all of the chains appear. All of this actually reminds me very much of Furikov's affinity test, where he claimed that conjurers and manipulators can be easily spotted because they tend to keep their dominant hands free. And if we were to add in the stereotype of the majority of of conjurers being left-handed, then you could have a good chance of narrowing it down to the exact affinity in that case. Sorry, I just I went on an end tangent there, I do that. But there's a lot of stuff like this in the chapter. So many references to previous characters and concepts that are very easily forgotten, especially after a three year hiatus. And one of those small things happens during the Haley section. Morena says that they've lost contact with the person that they left with Saradnik, which I believe is a reference to what I can only describe as a pile of bodily goop that we saw in Saradnik's room during chapter 384. And during that time, he was also speaking about Morena on the phone. So he clearly just took care of some business in the most brutal manner possible. Let's explain what's happening here though. The Haley family was previously supported by Saradnik. However, after Morena's mutiny, he now seeks to destroy them after he's done learning all of his nens. Morena knows this and wants to plant a spy amongst his cohort to prevent any surprises, which is a big revelation in and of itself, being that Morena is capable of reinfecting with contagion. This is dangerous because it means we can't just pick off the Haley members 
members one by one. If one falls, then Morena can just kiss someone else to take their place. And it also makes the family members so much more disposable than we previously thought, which puts them in a perfect position to be taking all sorts of volatile risks because why not? So this band of amateurs is far more threatening than I originally thought, which was already pretty damn threatening. In general, this whole family is giving me serious ant vibes, especially with the whole dismemberment room to dispose of the corpses. It's like a factory production line, in the same way that the ants would farm humans for food. Just significantly more morbid because at the very least, the ants, they were farming humans to eat. Meanwhile, the Hale guys, they're just taking lives and disposing of the leftover meat. I also did love seeing Morena in a gamer chair, very appropriate as the game master, but also for such a spine tingling figure, Morena had a couple of cute moments in this chapter. Togashi drawing her with this very purposely simplistic style, not at all commensurate to her role in the story. Oh, and just in case you're wondering, the kanji on Dogman's head is Inu, which, uh, which just means dog. He's interesting because he's an enhancer, which is something that I very rarely say. But there's this whole conversation about needing more levels and it makes sense because each level gained gives the user an aura boost. And Dogman, as an enhancer, probably doesn't have one of the tricksy tactical abilities that the other members do. So he's in a position where it probably just serves him better to gain more aura in order to be able to punch harder and more often. I think that Morena was also spot on about Saradnik wanting to kill her himself. Firstly, because Saradnik has already promised to kill one of his siblings with his own hands. And secondly, because she is a woman who betrayed him. And that, that is like the absolute worst worst thing in Saradnik land. Which leads us to the band of new characters introduced here, the childhood friends of said Saradnik, who have added a whole new layer of depth to the story. I mean, I get it, this chapter has lots of text and it does bombard you with a lot of characters. Honestly, something I definitely don't think is a strength of Togashi's is the way that he introduces characters. Definitely not that he does it. Introducing characters is good, but it, it's the way in which he does it. Oftentimes they just appear in very jarring ways and you need to like really sit down and invest as a reader to get to know them. And this was one of those chapters where you only get as much out as you put in. If you don't read the ass ton of text, then it is an easy zero out of 10. But if you do scale the wall of text, then it seriously raises the stakes and the tension and the excitement of everything. For example, a lot of time is spent conveying the idea that the Hale Lee family are technically treated as civilians, which would be bad if one of their bodies were to end up in the wrong place with the wrong soldier who files the wrong incident in the wrong category because then kaboom. That's right, right now the fate of this entire ship could be decided by a clerical error. And look, if that's not Hunter Hunter, then I don't know what is. It's especially problematic because the Kakin police and military may have their own way of understanding how to conduct business in a very subtle manner, but the Hunter Association is completely different. Part of their contract is very specifically to protect the princes, which may lead to the decision that it's in their best interest to eliminate the mafia families if they get any sort of whiff of rebellion. However, that sort of war could lead to a grand insurrection where they band together the like 200,000 people on tiers four and five, and then the ship again, it goes kaboom. So there is, just, there's, there's a lot of elements coming together here, specifically around Morena actually. I feel like the deeper we dive into this, the more she seems to be portrayed as the catalyst of destruction, even more so than the succession war. I'm oddly excited to be getting some Saradnik backstory though. If it wasn't clear already that he was probably the major prince of the Ark, then it should be now. And the story about hyper-focusing on the gun assembly provides a lot of context as to how he's able to become such a sudden Nen prodigy. He just has that correct mixture of raw talent talent and fierce drive, which supposedly contradicts his childhood friends here. I mean, they all demonstrate pretty phenomenal intelligence, but if I understand correctly, they're all deliberately keeping their distance so that they can remain as Saradnik's friends. And we only know the names of like two or three of them at the moment, but I find this group fascinating. And there is some really great potential here. For example, I'd love to see what it's like for just regular intelligent humans to be going up against a band of dumbass Nen using humans. How does a conflict like that pan out? I don't know, but I'm keen to see it. Also, so one of them is almost certainly going to be infected by Morena, right? In this chapter, there's a lot of what I refer to as plot rimming happening. Morena's rimming around the idea of, hmm, oh, I need to convert one of the prince's guards. And these friends of the relevant prince are rimming around the idea of, hmm, Morena needs to be stopped. And furthermore, I wonder if we could learn Nen somehow. So there's a lot of plot teasing that sets up this almost perfect scenario where one gets infected and then has a tricky situation to navigate. Being under the abilities of 
Marenna, but still having that loyalty to Saradnik. Oh, and also any one of these characters learning Nen is a game changer. They all seem to have that kind of intellect on par with a character like Karapika. So give one of them access to Nen and that is a whole new series protagonist. And I wouldn't be surprised if one of these figures ended up being the sort of Komugi of this arc. Someone with a surprise empathetic link to our main antagonist, who even though Saradnik is an objectively evil man, somehow manages to humanize him a bit, maybe. Or not, it could even be a reverse Komugi. Maybe these characters will serve as a sort of final barrier for Saradnik to break to truly embrace the monster that he's become slash always was. Either way, all I know is that my first thought when we get dumped with six to seven new characters is, uh, well, so almost all of you are probably going to die, right? And I don't feel like that's any different here. Six new protagonists, it's all just so much to juggle, especially when they all have effectively the same mission. So we can simplify that down to maybe one or two with some brutal fight battling. They go on to speak about Theta in this chapter, and we even get some flashbacks of her. And just as a quick recap, Theta was one of Saradnik's bodyguards prior to the whole Dark Continent thing, which I point out because there's often some confusion that she's from the Hunter Association because she's currently teaching Saradnik Nen. Full disclosure, I don't know how or why she and at least one of the other Saradnik bodyguards already knows Nen, especially because Theta's friend in this chapter knows absolutely nothing about it. In general though, it's just really sporadic and kind of random which bodyguards know Nen and which ones don't. So I, I generally try not to think too much about it. But there's also a mention of a tattoo artist member of the Hale Lee family, who I suspect is this guy. We saw him making an artwork out of one of the bodies that Saradnik managed to acquire via art some kill murder. And I suppose he's relevant because he's the reason why Morena may know the names and faces of this special Saradnik strike force and may even make an active effort to target them. It's also insane to think about though. We are what, like 50 chapters into this arc and we are still introducing new characters. Not only new characters, but seemingly incredibly pivotal ones. I keep saying this, but it's like Chimera Ants all over again, which is exciting because I do think that this arc has the potential to be the best since the Ants, but I do worry about exactly how long it's gonna take to finish. All of a sudden, 10 or even 20 chapters really doesn't seem like a lot, but I'm definitely invested and very eager to keep following this increasingly convoluted story.